Hello, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kat, this is Kat Makes, and today is chapter four of my Learn Tambor Embroidery series. The previous videos introduced you to the supply list that you need and the setup in order to get started with tambour embroidery, forming the basic stitch and adding beads in two different ways. So if you're following along, I'm expecting that you should be adding beads to your work at this point. And today we're going to take it one small step further and start looking at different sort of core patterns that you can use with tambour embroidery. We're going to add bugle beads and sequins and explore some of the different ways the stitch pattern can be used. So if you're not caught up to this point and you would like to be, go back and watch the other videos. I'll be here waiting for you when you get back. I'm not going anywhere. If you are caught up, that's awesome. Today we're going to stitch a little sampler and there's just a few things that I want you to keep in mind as we're going through these stitches that'll help you sort of inform your process moving forward. The first is that I want you to think of these things as sort of design elements, right? All of tambour embroidery is formed with a chain stitch, which makes it really, really easy to try new things because after you have the chain stitch down, the rest of it is just exploration and figuring out what styles work for you, what sorts of beads and sequins you like to add to your work, and what sort of stitches you like. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about how I design tambour embroidery and thinking about these things in terms of design elements. These little puzzle pieces almost that you're going to build your design out of is really helpful when you get to that point. The second thing I want you to remember is that it's all just a chain stitch, right? I'm showing you a few different techniques and things that you can do with a chain stitch, but the opportunities from here are really endless as far as how you want to combine materials and create textures and work with color and anything like that. So keep in mind that we're only just scratching the surface with this little sampler that I'm going to show you today. Got it? Okay, let's get right into it. First up, we have bugle beads. Bugle beads are really, really similar to seed beads. They're just longer, right? Little stretched seed beads, almost like little cylinders. And there's very little difference in the way that you stitch them when you're using them in tambour embroidery, but there are just a couple of considerations to keep in mind. The first is that bugle beads are more likely to have rough edges than seed beads, especially if you get into the sort of lower quality ones. So if you're going to use bugle beads, I definitely recommend spending a little bit of extra money to get a higher quality one because the edges have been fire polished usually to prevent any rough edges and those rough edges are likely to abrade the thread over time. So another thing to keep in mind is to make sure that you're using one of those nice strong threads like the Saju Filagant or the Guterman hand quilting thread that I recommended. Don't use regular all-purpose sewing thread if you're stitching with bugle beads because eventually over time it's likely going to cut through that thread. The other thing is you need to allow a lot more space when you're working with bugle beads, which seems very obvious when I say it, but what I like to do, and I'll show you this in just a minute, what I like to do is make sure that I'm holding that bugle bead up against the lower surface of the fabric before I plunge my needle into the fabric to make sure that I'm getting that stitch in exactly the right place that it wants to be so that the bugle bead is sitting nicely. One last consideration with bugle beads is that the more expensive ones are often more uniform in length and the less expensive ones, there's often a little bit of variety. Sometimes the variety is really nice, right? It can add a little bit more of an organic look to your piece, but if you're looking for a bugle bead to be extremely consistent in its sizing, definitely spend a little bit of extra money and go for a higher quality brand. Let's get into what they look like to stitch. I'm using Preciosa bugle beads for this little demonstration. They are pre-strung on Saju Filagant thread. I'm just tensioning this the way, same way that I always tension, and I've started off my stitch in the same way I always start taking one little stitch first. And then what you can see me doing right here is holding a seed bead against the lower surface of the fabric before I plunge my needle in to make sure that I'm getting the stitch placement exactly right. If you make your stitch a little bit too short, you're more likely to have that thread abrading problem over time and the seed bead is not going to sit as nice and flat against the surface as you might want it to. Whereas on the other hand, if you make the stitches too far apart, your bugle beads will be spaced a little bit further apart than you might like. So it's just about sort of perfect placement and making sure that you've got everything in the right place. When you finished with a line of bugle beads, just take one extra additional stitch before you complete your work and then cut the thread off and that's what it looks like. For the next part of our little sampler, I'm just going to fill in this little square with some bugle beads that I'm stitching back and forth. So I'm going down and then rotating, turning around, and going the opposite direction. And you can see here that I'm taking a few extra stitches before I start stitching in the opposite direction. And that's going to be a recurring theme here as we start to use fill stitches. So watch what happens as I approach here. I'm going to stitch my last bead up at the top. I'm going to take one teeny tiny stitch really close nearby and then I'm going to add that next bugle bead. 
If you just go ahead and try to switch directions and do a 180 with timbre embroidery, you end up with a little snarl of thread at the back, which I'll show you when we get to the satin stitch section because it's a lot more obvious. But the rule here is that if you're trying to make a strong change in direction, you want to take a little extra stitch before you make that rotation. Here I've decided that I want to space out the bugle beads a little bit more, so I've actually taken one extra stitch, then gone for a space, and then taken a second extra stitch as each time I'm changing direction by 90 degrees. And now I'm stitching those bugle beads up again, one tiny extra stitch, one spacer stitch, and one additional tiny extra stitch before I go in, there's the additional tiny extra stitch, before I go in with that last bugle bead. And here we go, just finishing off this little square with this little back and forth repeating pattern of bugle beads. Now I did get a little ahead of myself here and forget to film before I stitched some of the other sections, but that's what our bugle beads look like from the front. Next up, we'll talk about sequins. If bugle beads are like little elongated seed beads, then sequins are the opposite, little flattened beads turned into discs, right? There's so much more than that though. There's a whole amazing range of specialty sequins and that's like a whole video all on its own. But for our purposes of our discussion today, keeping things high level, there are two main types of round sequins, which are flat sequins and cup sequins. Flat sequins, like it says on the tin, they are round with a hole through the center. They're completely flat and they're absolutely gorgeous and I love them. And then there's also cup sequins, which as the name implies, are shaped like a little cup. Again, hole through the center. And the cool thing about cup sequins is that they have these little facets that are sort of worked into that cup shape. And that helps to reflect more light from more facets. So they appear sparklier. A lot of people really love cup sequins for that reason. I think actually my preference might be flat sequins for texture, but I'm gonna let you make your own decision and decide which ones you like for yourself. The other consideration with sequins is that the stitching direction matters in a way that it doesn't matter with beads. So in the bugle beads demo that we just did, we stitched back and forth with those bugle beads, right? One row went left to right, the next row went right to left, and we just followed like this. You can do that, of course, with sequins, but it looks very different than if you stitch them all in the same direction, so all going right to left and again right to left. I will show you what I mean by that in a minute. The other consideration with cup sequins, the direction you string them onto your working thread matters. This is not true of beads or the bugle beads or anything else that we've worked with up to this point, but since we want that little dome to be sitting against the fabric, right, if this was the sequin and I'm the fabric, we want it to be pointing away so that it can catch the light and those facets. And in order to do that, we want to string it onto the working thread with the dome facing this way, right? And then that way, when it slides up against the fabric, all of that sparkle, because remember we're working from the back, all of that sparkle will be able to shine away from the fabric. But that's enough of me talking about it. Let's get into the demo and I'll show you what I mean by creating different textures with different stitch directions with sequin. We start off the same way we always start with our little tie off and one extra stitch at the front, which you can see me doing here. And then when we make our stitches, when we're adding sequins, you wanna make the length of the stitch equal to the radius of the sequin. So that way that little sequin is being held by its little center circle firmly against the base of the fabric. And you can see that what we're doing is we're just using our thumb and index finger and sort of pinching that sequin to separate it from its friends. We only want one. Oftentimes you'll get two or three together. So I like to separate off a little group and then sort of massage, sort of rub in between my index finger and my thumb to just separate one sequin and then push that one up the row. And then exactly the same as when you add any other kind of bead, you just wanna hold it, use your index finger and hold it against the lower surface of the fabric and then form your stitch on the other side so that you're capturing it and holding it against that fabric. Now you can see here that when I'm stitching, each sequin is overlapping the last one that I stitched on by half. So you have this sort of little fish scale effect, which will be really obvious when I flip it over and show it to you. But you don't necessarily need to have that fish scale effect if you don't want to. And you can achieve that by taking one extra stitch in between each sequin that you add, which I'll show you here. We're working in exactly the same way as before. Here, I'm just gonna add one more sequin here. And then the only difference is we're adding a blank stitch in between each stitch that has a sequin. And you can see here how that is going to result in those sequins sitting right next to each other on the fabric with their little edges touching around the circumference rather than overlapping by half. The biggest thing to keep in mind here and the biggest thing to keep in mind with sequins in general, obviously, other than them being a little bit difficult to separate underneath, 
is to try and make sure that your stitch length is consistently equal to the radius length of your sequin. If you're working with smaller sequins, you're gonna be working with smaller stitches. These ones are a four millimeter sequin, which I quite like, and that means that each of my stitches is two millimeters long. And we're just gonna keep traveling until we've completed our little squiggle to add to our sampler. Show you what that looks like from the right side when we finish our sequin section, but I'm gonna move on to the fill stitches here. And remember, we talked about there being a very big difference in stitching back and forth versus stitching right to left, right to left, right to left, over and over again. So I'm going to fill this little square with a back and forth stitch area. So you can see that I'm using the overlapping sequins method by adding one every stitch. I'm just gonna change direction here with a blank stitch and then keep going on back in the opposite direction. And we're just gonna go back and forth for a little while so that we can fill this square and give you a really good idea of what this looks like. I like to imagine sequins as like little fish scales, right? So if you think about it, when we're stitching back and forth, base to top and then top to base again, you're essentially adding rows of fish scales that are facing opposite directions because the sequins are always laying on top of each other in the direction that you've stitched. I'm gonna speed through the rest of this section here just because I feel like you've probably got the idea of what's going on. Keeping in mind, of course, just to make sure you're only separating one sequin at a time and taking a blank stitch whenever you wanna change direction. And now I'm gonna switch up halfway through my square and switch back to that taking one sequin every two stitches, so the blank stitch in between so that they're laying next to each other instead of overlapping. And this is really interesting because you're going to notice less the direction change when we have a look at this from the front than you do with the overlapping, but it is still a little obvious if you look at the threads. So that can be a good option if you do really wanna go back and forth in a space is to add sequins that aren't overlapping each other because the difference is not quite as obvious. And now to compare all of that, I'm going to fill one more square with this directional stitching. But what I don't wanna to have to do is stop and start at the beginning of and the end of every row. I don't want to have to cut my thread and then restart again and go all the way back. So I'm going to start with one row of stitching. We're going to go from the base up to the top and I'm overlapping so adding one sequin every stitch and then watch what happens when we get to the top here. I've got I think two more sequins to add here. So I'm going to take one more stitch at the top and then I'm going to travel back down to the base just with some long empty stitches all the way back down to the side where I started. And you will see those from the front, those empty stitches, but they're about to be covered up by our next row of sequins. So I take those long stitches and then one teeny tiny stitch before I begin again. And we're going again from the base of the work to the top. So I'm essentially able to always stitch on my sequins from one direction and then just use a couple of empty stitches to travel down to the spot where I need to be. And you'll see how on the back here it looks thicker because I have those two rows of stitching. And again, just taking a couple of empty stitches back down to where I started, a tiny stitch to change direction, and then adding sequins. And we're just gonna keep doing that until our little square is full. There are certainly instances where you might wish to stop and actually cut your thread and weave it in before you start stitching from the lower direction, especially if you're traveling quite a long distance. But for something like this, and in most of the projects that I work on, I end up just using a couple of blank stitches to travel down instead of stopping and cutting my thread because it takes a lot less time and I find it to be more secure. And here looking at the front of the work, we finally get to see the difference between stitching back and forth, which is on the left, and stitching all in one direction, which is on the right, and the vastly different texture that this gives you. The last thing to show you in the sequin section is cup sequins. So if you look down at the sequins that I'm sliding up, I'm sliding them up so that the convex part of the cup, the little dome part of the cup is facing the back of the fabric, and that is everything to do with the way that I've strung them onto that working thread. So if you're finding they're not sitting the way that you want them to sit, you might just have to snip your thread, turn it around, and restring them the other way. And the key here to just remember again is make sure that you're trying to only separate one. These are a little bit more difficult to work with than flat sequins. They really do tend to kind of want to stick together. So just make sure that you're massaging them in between your index finger and your thumb to just free one little sequin at a time, slide it up and form that stitch around the other side. And finally, that's what our cup sequins look like from the front. Now these are a shinier finish. I used matte flat sequins as well. So they're artificially shinier, but they do get a lot more sheen than the flat sequins because they're catching all of those facets, which can be a really beautiful effect. And they also stand off the fabric a lot more than flat sequins do.
The sequins that I like to work with come in a unit that looks like this. This is a snake of sequins, and you can see if I hold it up really close, you can see them sort of falling. I love these sequins because they come pretty strong, but also because they're very high quality. They come from a company called Long Louis Martin. I will put the information in the description with everything else, so you don't have to worry about links. There are Long Louis Martin sells these in quite large quantities, but there are some places online, which I will also link below, where you can buy individual snakes of sequins, which is what I prefer to do. Next up, we're going to backtrack a little bit and add some seed beads to our sampler. So, of course, you're already practicing adding seed beads probably in a straight line, and they really do make sense as an outline. They're a very nice border. One of the things that I really like to do is add a seed bead border around like a flower petal, and then fill that flower petal with sequins and have them sort of lay on to give it a little bit of dimension and texture. Really like that. But what happens if we want to use seed beads as the fill in an area? We've got two different ways that we can do this. The first is just by going back and forth. So similar to the way we added the bugle beads to our sampler, we're going to go back and forth with seed beads and create this little brick laid texture that just is a really nice, lovely fill to a space. Sometimes we don't want it to necessarily look that uniform and regular. So there's a stitch that I personally really enjoy the texture of called the vermicelli stitch. Vermicelli is a type of pasta. And basically the idea, if you're familiar with free motion quilting, how you just sort of track around in this long meandering line that sort of fills a space and it fills like the entire space that it's given. The concept with vermicelli is that it you should be starting and stopping in the same place. This isn't always feasible depending on what you're using it for. But the really awesome thing about vermicelli that I love so much and the, the reason I use it a lot in my work is because you can do these really wide meandering areas of vermicelli where the stitch is quite loose and open all the way down into a vermicelli so dense that the stitches kind of change direction really, really tightly in this teeny tiny little area. And it fills an area entirely and looks just like a solid fill stitch. So it's so opaque because it's so full of beads. Let's add the back and forth fill and the vermicelli fill to our sampler now. Our first order of business again starts the same way these stitches always start with our little stitch at the front and one blank stitch. And then we're just going to add some beads. I'm gonna fill this square completely with seed beads. So I'm using side 11 Preciosa seed beads and again Saju Filagant thread and we're just going up and then we're going to turn around and go down again and up and down and up and down until our little square is full. This should be really straightforward for you if you've just come off trying sequins and it's honestly not a fill that I use terribly much in my work because I don't like how uniform it is but it is really handy for instances when it needs to be. It is worth noting that you do want to take that one empty stitch when you change direction the same way that we did with our bugle beads and sequins, and that is what she looks like so far. So we just have this nice little compact geometric looking fill, and we're going to switch now and work on the vermicelli stitch. So I'm starting in the lower corner and I've actually drawn myself a rectangle, and we're going to do a few different types of vermicelli in this rectangle. So first I'm going to start with a meandering large vermicelli stitch where I'm adding one bead for every stitch, which is another option. You don't have to add one bead for every stitch. Sometimes I do them sporadically. And I'm just kind of thinking about changing directions every once in a while and keeping the organic shape as much as I can and thinking about the density. So thinking about how many beads I would like in a given sort of square inch of my design, if that makes sense. If it helps when you're starting with vermicelli, you can draw yourself a little meandering line and then follow it with your beads. But as you get to be more practiced, you'll find it easy to just sort of eyeball a space and decide what path you'd like to take as you sort of meander through it. I can understand how that would be a little bit difficult for a beginner though, so if you do need to draw yourself that little line as a little guidance, then that's totally fine. So again, I'm just thinking about changing direction frequently. I don't want to be going in one direction for too long and thinking about how dense I would like my vermicelli fill to be. It really is just such a handy stitch to have in your arsenal for background because it's so versatile. There's so many different things you can do with it. So I'm going to switch things up a little bit here and I'm going to go from adding one bead every stitch to adding one bead every couple of stitches. You can do this in a lot of different ways. You can say you're going to add exactly one bead for every fourth stitch or you can do what I do, which is a little bit less prescriptive. I try to keep the density of my stitches pretty consistent, so I don't want to ever be getting too close to previous lines of stitches and keep things looking visually consistent, and I all want to keep that same visual consistency with my beads. So if I'm passing right by a previous row of stitching that has a bead, I won't add a bead in that area because I want the spread of beads to be consistent as well. 
So you can see here that we're just kind of maintaining the same visual density that we had with the spacing, but I'm adding a bead kind of every four to six stitches, depending on what we've got going on in this particular area. So I've continued that around and I've got a decent little section, but I still have a teeny tiny little bit left of my rectangle for my vermicelli sampler. So I'm going to switch back again and we're going to do a slightly more dense vermicelli. So not completely opaque because that's what I'm gonna do in the next section. But here I've gone back to adding one bead for every stitch and I've tightened up my wiggly consistency, my vermicelli consistency quite a lot. So I'm getting a lot closer in there with these beads just to show you how much variety you can achieve with the vermicelli stitch. So I've got one more little wiggle to go back over here and then we're going to do our completely filled dense vermicelli section. So if we think about the larger area of vermicelli as going from changing direction every five or six beads and keeping things really wide and open and loose, when we're working on a dense section of vermicelli fill, we really wanna be changing stitch direction every single bead. One of the reasons this dense vermicelli fill is so nice, and one of the reasons that I quite enjoy it, is because it really takes advantage of the ways that beads sparkle, and by changing the direction of the stitch every single time you make a stitch, you're changing the direction that the bead is sitting on the fabric and allowing them to catch the light in different ways, which is going to add to that sparkly intensity and gives you this really lovely organic fill that takes advantage of the ways that the beads are shaped. It does take a little bit of extra time and it is very possible, especially with the denser vermicelli fill to sort of stitch yourself into a corner, but it is absolutely so worth it in the end. I really love the way this technique looks. So there's our regular back and forth stitch as against the vermicelli fill and a couple of different options for you there. My last trick with seed beads doesn't have an official name like vermicelli. And I didn't make this up. I've seen other people doing this, but I have yet to find an official name for it. So I call it a rope stitch or a ladder stitch. You might find a name. If you do, figure it out. I'd love to know in the comments. It is just a series of chain stitches, but it looks remarkably different. So I'm gonna show you two ways to make my little rope stitch or ladder stitch using seed beads and bugle beads, and then also a technique that I use where I space them out so that I can use both seed beads and bugle beads. And I employ this one a lot in my work. I've used it on quite a few designs. And this is really cool because it's basically utilizing a stitch pattern of adding beads and then blank stitches to control the changing of the direction and then going back adding more beads another blank stitch control the changing of direction that's enough of me talking about it let me show you what i mean the first version i'm going to show you is with seed beads and we're going to start off by adding one bead and then two beads just to start this off with a nice tidy corner but my little rope is going to be three beads wide I wouldn't do this with too much width, wouldn't maybe more than six, but you can definitely vary the width between sort of two and six. And what I'm doing here is I'm adding three beads at a time and then taking an empty stitch, both forward and backward on a sort of 45 degree angle. Again, you don't have to do a 45 degree angle, you can do this uh, straight back and forth, but I find the angle adds a nice bit of texture. So the stitch pattern here is we're gonna take one blank stitch up, as you can see, and then go backwards to add our three beads take that stitch with the beads and then go up again one blank stitch before adding three more beads. One, two, three. And then taking another blank stitch. So in between every stitch where we add our beads, we take a blank stitch to get ourselves in the right direction. And that is because we are changing direction. We're going 180 degrees here every time we make a shift. So we wanna make sure that our thread is ready and positioned the way that it needs to be in order to accept those beads. I really like the texture this makes, especially on a diagonal. It's nice just going straight across back and forth as well. It's exactly the same stitch to do it that way, but I particularly enjoy the diagonal. I find it makes a really nice border, especially along the hem of a piece or the upper edge. And I've actually used this on uh, spaghetti strap sleeves as well. I just find it really, really nice. And to finish this section off, I'm just gonna add two beads and then one bead to sort of square off that edge. And this is what it looks like from the front. So you can see that it just kind of has this nice little ropey texture and just, they all sit really nicely on that diagonal. So now we're gonna do exactly the same thing with bugle beads, nothing has changed. In the stitch pattern, we're going to add one bead, then take a blank stitch up and then go backwards to add our next bugle bead, one more blank stitch, then the bugle bead stitch, and then another blank stitch and then just carry on in this pattern of blank stitches plus bugle beads. Again, you can go straight back and forth as more of like rungs on a ladder, or you can take them a little bit more of a diagonal route here. You've got definitely options. 
but it's just really just a lovely border and I really enjoy adding these in my work. We're just going to speed through this little area here as well and just keep in mind with these bugle beads that you're still trying to follow those same rules as before in making the stitches wide enough to accept the bugle beads and making sure that you're not pulling your tension too tight or doing anything that could lead to that thread abrading over time. And that's what she looks like with bugle beads. The last one I have to show you is similar but with a little bit of a twist. So here I'm going to stitch on bugle beads first, same way as I did before, except I'm going to leave an extra big space so that you can see there's an, a little section where you can see right through in between the sections where the bugle beads are going down. But again, I'm still adding the blank stitch in between every bugle bead that I lay. So bugle bead, blank stitch, bugle bead, blank stitch, and this time I am going just directly back and forth in this little ladder formation. So I'm going to finish this one up first, and then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to add some seed beads. Finishing that up at the top, and then we come back in with our seed beads, and I'm trying to... I've, I've approximated that each bugle bead is four seed beads long, so each one of my little sections I'm adding four seed beads to form my little ladder, and I'm doing exactly the same thing and basically just overlapping those stitches and catching my seed beads because they're running away from me here a little bit, just overlapping those stitches right on top of each other so that I end up with a nice little pattern of alternating bugle beads and seed beads. And this is going to save us from having to work with loose beads because it's not nearly as fast, but here we can just add those beads in between and it makes the area look a lot more complex and it adds just a lovely finish to your work. And that's what those three options look like. We're making progress. Now we've got quite a collection of different beads and sequins on our sampler. The last thing I want to show you today is thread work. There's a version of satin stitch that you can create with your hook, and it's not identical to satin stitch that you can create with a needle and thread, but it is a very important part of the Ari tradition. And I always switch my work over and work from the front because when we're forming that chain stitch, your little chain loop is the direction that's facing you. And there's one singular thread that passes on the other side where you're holding the thread in your hand. And I want that loop to be on the surface because it takes up more space and therefore I will get a denser fill. If that explanation doesn't make sense, it will make sense when I show you the completed work and you'll understand why if you're looking for a very dense satin fill with just thread, it's better to work from the front. So I'm going to flip my frame over now and I'm going to show you two different ways that you can fill a space first with just a little chain stitch fill and then also a little satin stitch leaf because that is what I use my satin stitch for most cases. This one is pretty obvious, so I'm going to speed through this step. I'm going to start with a satin stitch that is a regular size stitch, maybe about three millimeters long per stitch, and we're just going to very simply go back and forth here. So I'm going to go and fill this little rectangle that I've drawn for myself all the way up and then all the way back, and we'll go back and forth a couple of times just so that you can kind of get an idea for what that texture looks like. I really particularly like this one for filling long skinny areas. I did one uh, particular design with sort of blades of grass almost, and I filled them vertically with this, and it just gave it this really nice, uh, beautiful, very deep sort of texture. So I'm going to switch things up a little bit now, and I'm going to show you, we're going to slow way on down, and I'm going to take some large stitches. So I'm going to fill half the space with a satin stitch. I'm going in one direction, and remember I told you, I, I told you I was going to show you what would happen if you change stitch direction without taking a tiny stitch. So here's a large stitch, I'm going to take a tiny stitch here because I need to, because I'm changing direction, and we're going to go on back, take one more large stitch, and I'm going to show you right here what happens if you try to change direction without, oh, hang on, I snagged the thread, there we go. Show you what happens if you try to change direction without taking a large stitch. I just head in the other direction, and my teeny tiny little loop gets really small, and that's the, exactly the thing that we don't want, whereas if we grab that loop, take the stitch, and then before we start going back in the opposite direction, take that teeny tiny little stitch, then we can carry on moving in the other direction, and we don't encounter that little snare problem. So that's why you always want to take a little stitch right before you change direction. Otherwise, you're going to pull the previous stitch back through the fabric and create an unsightly little snare. So I'll just fill in this section, and then we'll move on to our leaf, which also takes advantage of this rule of the tiny stitch that we don't want to take. There was another little demonstration right there. And there are some ways to sort of leverage that particular behavior, but that's specifically what we're not looking for in satin stitch. So let's move on to this leaf now. I've drawn myself a little leaf shape, and I'm starting at the base of the leaf again with just my regular little starting stitch. I'm gonna pull up that tail and get it out of the way. 
and I'm going to be thinking the whole entire time I'm stitching this leaf, I'm thinking about the sort of vein direction that I want the threads to travel in because that's what's going to make it look uh, authentic and leaf shaped. So I'm traveling on an angle here and every time I take a long stitch, I also take a tiny stitch before I change direction and I'm going to have my connection traveling up the center. So I'm going, when I turn around, I'm aiming for about the center of that leaf. You can draw yourself a little guideline if you'd like, but we're just taking a long stitch and then a tiny stitch and then turning around, taking a long stitch and then a tiny stitch again, really, really focusing on the angle that we want our stitches to lay in. And usually when I get sort of two thirds of the way up the leaf, I'll take a couple of little halfway stitches and bury them inside. We're gonna start moving a little bit faster here so that we're not taking all of the time in the world. I'll start taking a couple of smaller stitches so that I can change the direction. So we're gonna see that here in a moment. I'm following that leaf pattern up and you can go really, really densely here. This does just kind of depend. I am using a DMC rayon thread for this example and the previous example. I quite like working with rayon just because it's so shiny. There's a little half stitch there. It's going to depend on whether you're working with a silk or a cotton or a rayon or even a wool, how densely packed you choose to make these stitches. And you're also probably going to want to go up a hook size from when we were working with beads as I have here. But just taking those little half stitches is going to help you sort of control the direction that your statin stitch is traveling in. And that's half the leaf, so we're going to speed up even more to get through the second half. And the second half of this leaf is identical to the first, so I'm going to skip on to the good part and show you the finished product. And here it is, our lovely little satin stitched leaf. All right, team, that was fun. That's our little sampler. It's all finished. If you've been stitching along, maybe you have a little sampler of your own. I'd love to see it. If you are the homework type of person, I don't want to assign you homework if you don't want to do it, but if you would like a task, what I would like for you to do is consult Pinterest or whatever your main source of inspiration is for embroidery designs. Go and have a look. See if you can find some tambour embroidery in the wild and see if you can sort of track the stitch patterns. This is gonna help you learn. It's one of the things that I did, especially really early on to sort of figure out tambour embroidery techniques and what I wanted to try. Go and look and you see if you can just trace with your finger or with your eye or whatever, uh, a piece of tambour embroidery and see if you can follow the path the thread took with the beads. You will be surprised, I think, having done this little sampler and started to follow along with those threads, you'll be surprised at what you can learn from that. I've also got a couple of suggestions for you if you'd like to practice. You can make a sampler if you'd like. I'd love for you to make a sampler just like mine, but your sampler does not have to be discrete units of stitches like mine was. You can also create yourself a little motif and fill it with different things. I've got a feather sampler that I really enjoy where each of the sections of the feather is filled with a different technique. In that way, you're actually ending up with a finished item that isn't just like a little friend in a frame like I've got here. If that suits you more, then definitely go for that instead. And that also gives you a little bit of an opportunity to sort of flex your creative design muscles. Speaking of creative design muscles, we are going to come back to that as it is the topic of next week's episode. The spoiler alert here is that everybody has really different ways that they like to do design and there is no right way. I can only show you my way as a way of hopefully giving you some inspiration. That said, I am going to show you my workflow and give you as many examples as I can with photos of what my patterns look like before I start stitching them with the hopes that it gives you the inspiration that you need to dig into whatever workflow and process works for you with embroidery design. Of course, if you want to keep up with me and see what my projects are, what I'm working on, and how my peacock capelet is tracking, because that is currently what I'm working on, come hang out on TikTok and Instagram. I would love to see what you're up to. I've had a couple of tags and people sending me photos of their own tambour embroidery progress so far, and I'm just so stinking excited that you guys are all along for the ride with me. I love it so much, so keep it up. Lastly, thank you for watching. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the updates and I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.